Okay, quick and dirty glucocorticoids. So, we're going to talk about anti-inflammatory drugs. We've already kind of talked about non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So, now we're going to talk about uh, steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So, basically, steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs work on um, up here at the phospholipase area um, of the pain of the tissue response to injury or the inflammation pathway. And when we use uh, steroids, right here is where it stops the, um, the inflammation, the modulators that start inflammation. And those would be prostaglandins as well as leukotrienes. And then um, thromboaxins, these right here, these cause the aggregation of platelets, and this is has to do with um, why you get bruises and things like that. So corticosteroids are hormones that are produced by the adrenal cortex, and there's two types that we see in veterinary medicine. Well, actually, that we see in humans, animals, mammals, and the first type is glucocorticoids, and how these work is they have inflammatory anti-inflammatory effects and they inhibit phospholipase and phospholipase um, is an enzyme that damages cell membranes and like we saw from the slide when we were talking about um, the inflammatory pathway this is kind of what blocks the damage um, of that phospholipase glucocorticoids also um, raise the concentration level of the liver glycogen and that has to do with how your body, your liver metabolizes the protein and other foods that you eat. Um, and so this can increase gl blood glucose levels. And this is important to remember if you're doing um, blood work on an animal and you're wondering, hey, why is this patient's blood glucose level high? They do affect how we metabolize carbohydrates, protein, and fat metabolism, and they're regulated by negative feedback. And we'll talk about a little bit more about negative feedback in just a few minutes. All right, so the negative feedback loop. So basically what you need to know is that glucocorticoids are produced by the adrenal cortex, which is right here, okay? And it's in response to the release of ACTH or the secretion of ACTH, which is adrenocorticotropic hormone. And it's excreted by the anterior, right here, pituitary gland. And what happens is it excretes the ACTH and that um, is controlled actually um, up where you don't see it up here, there's your hypothalamus, which is kind of in your brain. So um, the hypothalamus releases um, this factor, which then causes the anterior pituitary gland to excrete ACTH. And they work in conjunction with each other. And so when you have low blood levels of glucocorticoids, then your hypothalamus secretes the releasing factor. And then that releasing factor tells your anterior pituitary gland, hey, I need some ACTH. And then the ACTH turns on the adrenal cortex and that produces the glucocorticoid. And then the reverse is the, it works the other way. So if you have too high of a level of glucocorticoids in your body, your hypothalamus stops secreting that um, ACT, the releasing factor, which then tells your anterior pituitary to stop producing as much ACTH, which then tells your adrenal cortex, hey, I don't need that glucocorticoid. And so this is basically checks and balances. And it keeps our, the glucocorticoid levels at the proper blood concentration. So we need to think about this when we're using glucocorticoids because if we use too much or too little, we can cause disease. So why do we use glucocorticoids? Well, because they are actually really good. They, they are feel-good drugs. They can help with a lot of um, conditions. So mainly we use them for inflammatory conditions like allergic responses, um, which you can have a, an inflammatory response with an allergic reaction. We use them for autoimmune disorders. Uh, so if they have um, autoimmune-mediated um, hemolytic anemia, something like that. Um, if they have shock, so let's say they had a, um, 
they were hit by a car, were in some sort of shock, we might use that. Um, if they had, and uh, sometimes dogs, especially dogs that are brachycephalic um, and their eyes are bulgy, kind of like Boston's, um, their eyes can actually pop out quite easily. Um, and so now you have a proctose eye. And so there's inflammation there. So we would use glucocorticoids to help with that inflammation. We also might use it for interior um, inflammation in the eye. So maybe they're having um, a, a um, glaucoma or some other event in their eye. So we might use glucocorticoids for that. Um, they may have um, in uh, they may have uh, disc disease, like uh, invertebral intervertebral disc disease as well, or lameness, okay? So allergic responses, these could be drug reactions. Let's say we gave some a vaccine and the dog had a um, allergic response to that. So we might use some steroids for that. Contact dermatitis, so they got in, they touched a chemical, um, anaphylaxis. So that kind of goes down to that drug reaction there. And then we may use them for systemic diseases. And this would be Addison's disease. And we'll talk a little bit about more about Addison's disease in uh, the next couple of weeks. Um, and then cancer. So if a patient has cancer, we may use that. So basically, we use these because they are feel-good drugs. They reduce that inflammation and pain, so they make us feel better. They make our animals feel better. One, especially if they're itchy, oh, they're scratching, they have puritis, we're gonna really wanna help them and they're gonna feel better when we give them glucocorticoids. They can reduce scarring. So let's say maybe we are doing a type of surgical procedure and we really don't want it to heal quickly. And this would be something that we would see actually in ophthalmic uh, cases. So we might want uh, the healing to be a little slower so that it doesn't scar as much. And then we also may use this to help reduce tissue damage. So if they had some lameness or something like that, we may want to um, reduce the damage to the tendons and the ligaments underneath. But there, there are drawbacks to using glucocorticoids, and these kind of have to do with um, the negative feedback loop and, and what happens when we use these glucocorticoids. So the biggest one actually was actually a benefit, right? That's delaying wound healing. So sometimes we want them to heal quickly. Let's say they're having a spay or a neuter. We don't really want them on glucocorticoids when, they're do when we're doing surgeries like that because we want them to heal quickly. It does protect, block protective processes, so uh, we can cause a little bit more damage um, if we are using these with, um, by they, they decrease the attraction of the leukocytes that damage that site. Um, they can, and that's how you get this increased risk of infection. They also may cause gastrointestinal ulceration and bleeding. So you can get some GI problems and that has to do with blocking the COX-1 uh, inhibitors and the COX, um, the COX, uh, COX oxygenase, which is what we talked about with the non-steroidals. And it also can increase the risk for, of corneal ulceration, not just the oral, glucocorticoids, but topical glucocorticoids. So it's really important that we do fluorescein stain, staining to before we apply a topical um, ophthalmic, uh, uh, ophthalmic to a patient that has um, into the eye because we want to make sure there's not an ulcer there. Because if there is an ulcer, this will just make the ulcer even worse. And then it can have induce ab abortions. And it can induce abortions through all the trimesters. Uh, the last trimester, it can cause them to go into labor sooner. So there are some side effects to using glucocorticoids, and the main ones are PUPD, which is excessive urination and excessive drinking, and excessive eating. Really, they are not hungry, which is what the polyphagia is. They just feel like they're hungry. So you need to make sure when you're talking to owners that one, they have water available at all times. Two, they get the animal out more frequently. If it's a dog, make sure they're cleaning the litter box uh, more frequently if it's a cat. And then the third thing you need to tell them is they are really not hungry. They just think they're hungry. And this all has to do with the liver and metabolizing the glycogen. 
And there's two other things we need to think about with uh, using steroids. So the first one is hydrogenic Cushing's disease. And what hydrogenic means is it's caused by the treatment. So when you give an animal glucocorticoids, you can cause Cushing disease. And what Cushing's disease is, is it's hyperadrenocortism. And it's caused by overproduction of glucocorticoids. And usually it's because of a tumor in the adrenal gland. It could be in the pituitary gland. But we're causing this in animals <clears throat> by giving them glucocorticoids. So in order to help this, um, what happens is healthy animals, their glucocorticoid levels rise. The hypothalamus says, hey, anterior pituitary gland, we don't need to make any more ACTH. And so then this slows down the production of glucocorticoids in the body. So when we give glucocorticoid supplements, um, the body's animal responds the same way. So basically it says the same thing. Hey, hypothalamus, we don't need any more of that. Um, we don't need any more of that. We want you to release this stuff and the anterior pituitary gland then stops to produce the CHTH. And so as long as they're giving the treatments, the adrenal cortex doesn't need to make a, doesn't need to make the glucocorticoid. And so what can happen over time is the adrenal cortex can start to shrink or atrophy and then it can't make it on its own. So what happens is uh, animals, the blood levels start to decrease and then when you stop the treatment, the body stop, doesn't is unable to make the glucocorticoids on its own. And so this happens, when this happens, then you get something called hydrogenic um, Addison's disease, which is hypoadrenocortism. And uh, so you want to prevent, you can prevent hydrogenic Addison's disease. And you can do this by using the lowest dose possible and withdrawing them from steroids gradually. Okay, and this allows the adrenal cortex time to uh, kick back on and start producing its own natural uh, glucocorticoids. So the categories of um, steroids that we will see uh, are short acting, which are usually less than 12 hours. And these are like cortisone or hydrocortisone, and these tend to be topical. So these are things that you might put um, on your skin. They may be ophthalmolic drops. Uh, you may see some oral suspension or tablets, as well as injectable hydrocortisone. These are things that you don't use that we are not expecting to last longer than 12 hours. So then we have intermediate acting, which lasts about 12 to 36 hours. And these come from injection to creams and ointments, as well as tablets. And then the, there are long acting, and these last longer than 36 hours. And these would be something like dexamethasone, betamethasone, or fluorcezone. And uh, dexamethasone, I know you've seen it used in the lab. Um, you know, you have it pull it down, and we pretend to draw it up. Dexamethasone actually would be used long term, especially if the dog had like a, had IVDD and we wanted some treatment uh, to help uh, reduce the inflammation in the spine. So we need to talk a little bit about the differences between prednisone and prednisolone. So basically, when we give a dog prednisone, or we ourselves take prednisone, once we take that through the first pass effect, which we've talked about before, the liver changes the prednisone into prednisolone. So it breaks it down into prednisolone. Well, this is great, right? If you're a dog or a human. The problem comes about when you're a horse or a cat or an animal that has liver dysfunction. You can't break down prednisone as well as you once were. Or if you were a horse or a cat, you couldn't break down prednisolone at all. So this is the difference between the two. So prednisolone is uh, already converted. So when they take prednisolone, um, the liver does not have to convert it into something that the body can handle. So dogs can get prednisone, cats and horses get prednisolone. And animals that have liver dysfunction, they should probably get, be given prednisolone also. 
All right, just some key points to remember. Glucocorticoids may make you feel good, but they don't cure the disease that you have. They may cause more problems. So if you have a fungus or if you have an infection going on, they can make infections worse. We always want to use caution um, when, we're giving, uh, when we're giving glucocorticoids to um, pregnant animals because it can cause abortions. Uh, whenever possible, we wanna to try to use the topical form because this will then um, prevent things like systemic imbalances. And this leads to the next one, which is use alternate day dosing. And always use the lowest dos the dose possible because you don't want to get iatrogenic Cushing's disease, which can then uh, cause problems later if you don't taper them off the glucocorticoids because then they can get iatrogenic Addison's disease. And we never want to use glucocorticoids in animals that have corneal ulcers. All it's going to do is make an ulcer worse and uh, people are not happy about that. So... I uh, hope you liked this short little talk about uh, steroids and glucocorticoids and how they're used in the body. If you have any questions, please feel free to make sure you let me know. Thanks. Bye.